Bonjour à toutes, bonjour à tous. Nous allons pouvoir commencer prochainement. Nous sommes très heureuses de, de commencer la, la, la saison de ce séminaire en recevant Els Consuegra de la Virge Université de Bruxelles, désolée pour la prononciation, qui va nous présenter les dispositifs de formation des enseignants à l'éducation inclusive. Euh, alors, ce, ce séminaire euh, a pour objectif euh, tout au long de l'année euh, de euh, proposer euh, des interventions, des présentations consacrées euh, aux, à, aux questions de dispositifs réflexifs et collaboratifs euh, destinés euh, à servir le développement professionnel des enseignants dans le cadre du développement euh, du numérique et évidemment aussi dans le cadre de l'école euh, inclusive. Euh, le séminaire d'aujourd'hui euh, se tiendra euh, en anglais, mais les questions ensuite pourront euh, euh, se, se poser en français et les réponses pourront se faire euh, en, en français. Also, Els prepared a, a support in French. So Elsie is a, a professor, uh, and she she is uh, she speaks a lot of languages, including French and <laughs> and English. And uh, she's gonna um, basically make the presentation in English, but with the support in French. Donc les diapositives sont en français, et pour ceux qui sont en présentiel, on a trouvé un moyen, et d'ici cinq minutes, ça va apparaître. Uh, normalement, vous avez tous reçu le lien, uh, so you can do that, and uh, you're welcome <laughs> for those on site. Um, uh, okay, we can see uh, the uh, the uh, diaporama. Uh, okay, if you didn't receive it, um, how did you send it? By email. Oh, no, uh, before. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna deal with that now. Uh, maybe for now she's just introducing her things and you can deal with, uh, I, I, I'm sending it. Uh, and also it will be on uh, uh, in a few seconds. In, uh, so, Please don't, uh, I think you should yeah. begin, okay. uh, unless you think it's necessary that they have this in front of their eyes. So th there is a, a slide saying, formation des enseignants pour l'éducation inclusive. Donc, um, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this session. Um, uh, my name, Ani. So first, what is the program? Yeah, obviously the ones who are present here physically cannot see the slide, um, but on the slide is just the program. So first I will uh, give a short presentation and introduction um, about myself and the Brussels context in which we are working and training teachers. Then I'm going to go deeper in um, to the definition of inclusive education. Um, I'm going to talk a little about about definitions and also some models and indicators that are already exist and have been published. And then I'm going to um, present to you a study which uh, we performed, Helim uh, and myself performed, uh, where we did a systematic review of review studies on how to train teachers for inclusive education. And we will present 10 principles that we have extracted from these uh, review that um, yeah, are principles for effective training of teachers for inclusive education. And then at the end, I've prepared a small um, reflection exercise where I will invite you to uh, reflect on the extent to which these 10 principles are also present in your teacher education programs. And that's uh, the content of the presentation. So to begin, I will just briefly introduce the team and um, uh, the context of Brussels. Um, so I'm now uh, sharing a slide with, with three uh, pictures on them. Um, 
one of them on the pictures is here in the room, which is Helene. Helene uh, has done her master thesis on the topic of how to prepare teachers for inclusive education. And she's now uh, doing a PhD uh, with another colleague uh, of ours at the uh, Brussels Teacher Education Department. Um, another colleague on the slide is Margot Longville. Margot um, has started this academic year in our team and she's working on inclusive education at the VUB. So this is a policy research that she's doing about how to make our own university more inclusive. And then uh, the third picture is my picture. I'm, uh, uh, as Muriel already mentioned, I'm a professor um, in the teacher education department at the Multidisciplinaire Institute Leerarenopleiding um, at Vrije Universiteit Brussel. And I'm, um, well, all three of us, Margot, Helene, and myself, we are educational scientists, so uh, pedagogue. Um, so, and we are situated in uh, Brussels, Brussels, the capital of Belgium. Um, and there we train uh, teachers. Um, and, you know, I could, at the beginning when I was preparing this presentation, this situation of Brussels was part of the presentation um, because I really only presented like the, um, yeah, the, the findings we found, like the more abstract findings we found in the literature about how to train teachers. But um, when, while discussing in the uh, collective uh, learning community about urban and inclusive education, we really came to the, yeah, we became very aware of the fact that you cannot train teachers in a decontextualized way. Um, you have to take this neighborhood, your particular environment into account when training uh, teachers. Um, so I thought it was also important for you as the audience to understand and have a little bit more insight into the Brussels context. Um, so Brussels is um, uh, a capital, uh, a very big uh, city, uh, city urban. It's the, it has 3.4 uh, million of inhabitants. If you take the agglomeration and the bigger um, agglomeration of the city, um, and it's the fifth richest region of the EU27, uh, but it also has quite a high uh, percentage of poverty. One third of the population is living in poverty in Brussels. Um, and also, and there's, I think this is very typical for many cities, so you have uh, really this contrast between the, um, the richer uh, south and southeast and the poorer center and northwest of the city. Um, like Jammer uh, genoeg, like it's a pity to see that the poverty numbers are rising year after year. So um, the number of children that are growing up in uh, families that are at risk of poverty is growing um, here and on the slide. Um, I just put like, uh, yeah, it's, it's a graphic of the, the number of the percentage of children aged zero to three years old that are uh, growing up in poverty from 2000 to 2017. And you can see that it increased from 15% to you know, 25, 26%. And this, uh, yeah, figure stops in 2017. Just, just for those in presential, I see three who don't have a computer or are not connected to it. Uh, they cannot see the no. thing. Just uh, Guillermo, Ankarna, and uh, uh, Laurent, uh, you don't have access to the things. I'm not succeeding in making this work. I'm going to try to start it again, but uh, maybe you try to pair with someone who has a computer or you open yours. Yes. Okay. And Yerma, if you want to access the slide, maybe you can just go with Shruti or with Ankana. And uh, yeah. ah, you succeeded, see great. So voila. So I was just saying yeah, that this uh, visual stops at 2017, but since 2017, the number of children growing up in poverty has, uh, has increased even further. Uh, there's also lots of mobility and migrations in, um, I think you have to, yeah. 
<laughs> um, in Brussels. So 74% of the inhabitants, yeah, it's like echo. It just wait a second. No problem. So 74% of inhabitants um, have a non-Belgian origin, um, and it's uh, the, the city has over 180 nationalities. Um, and also there's uh, this revolving door principle, um, which means that there's lots, uh, lots of people immigrating to the country, uh, to the city, but also emigrating again. So it's uh, yeah, a lot of mobility, uh, passage uh, in the city. Um, there's, so there's a lot of cultural diversity in the city and in some um, neighborhoods, some neighborhoods are more segregated uh, and homogeneous, uh, like certain um, groups with certain migration backgrounds living in, in certain uh, neighborhoods, but there's also neighborhoods that are quite well mixed and integrated. For example, it was very nice for me to um, uh, to learn of, uh, some years ago that the neighborhood where I'm living in, in Brussels, it's uh, Conscience Week in uh, Evre, is uh, one of the, is actually the most integrated neighborhood of Brussels. So in, in the slide, you can see that in 2020, uh, the share of people who had a Belgian background, a European migration background, an Asian migration background, and an African migration background are quite nicely balanced. Um, my own migration background, which is Latin America, is um, not really um, like you see. America is the is the one continent that is lesser uh, represented um, in my neighborhood and also in the entire uh, entire Brussels. But like the other migration um, backgrounds are nicely um, balanced in my own neighborhood. Um, there's also lots of multilingualism in our city. Um, 51 percent of the households uh, speak only French and then uh, like the other half, um, 46 percent of the households speak French and at least one other language and then there's three percent who speak French and at least two other languages. Um, and I've also uh, included um, a, a table of which are the other languages uh, that are spoken in Brussels. And you see that dominant languages are English, Dutch, um, Spanish, Arabic, Italian, German, Turkish, Portuguese, Lingala, etc. So it's um, very diverse. And we also see like in the young children that are now yeah, being born and that will enter education in a few years, one quarter um, of the children that are going to school in the Dutch uh, speaking system in Brussels do not speak Dutch at home. I oh, know only one four, one, only one out of four speaks Dutch at home. So we have, um, yeah, I, I did not include the entire complex educational system of Brussels in our presentation because we already did this presentation in when uh, we um, invited uh, some of you guys in Brussels. Um, so there is a presentation available on this topic. Yeah? So we have multiple um, uh, systems offering education in Brussels. And one of them is the Dutch speaking uh, system of the Flemish uh, region. Um, but uh, of the preschoolers, only one out of four children going to these schools actually speaks Dutch at home. And so the majority um, of the children in preschool does not speak the instructional language at home. Um, and so this is like some numbers on the Brussels context, but I imagine that many of these things are very comparable um, to situations in other cities, such as Barcelona or maybe Gothenburg. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, there's, of course, certain um, commonalities um, that are present as challenges in, in very urban uh, contexts. And um, we see that in big cities, cities are usually richer but they also have more inequities um, and this comes with the uh, with different kinds of uh, challenges eh? we already know the challenges that have to do with sustainable development and but there's also challenges with regards to um, the provision of uh, services such as healthcare or education um, and um, yeah, it's it, the sustainable development goals um, 
explicitly state yeah, that um, education is important to make our societies um, ready for all of these changes and, and to find solutions for all of these challenges that we are confronted with um, and ensuring inclusive, equitable and quality education um, and the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities is key uh, to build a prosperous, healthy and equitable society. So, so I think we can all agree there's lots of challenges um, societies are facing today and um, there is great consensus that education is a crucial resource um, to tackle these challenges. And also inclusive education is being put forward there. So then, yeah, if we look into this concept of um, inclusive education, what is it exactly? Yeah, because we have already mentioned it a few times. Um, there's some authors that have done the amazing, the amazing work of reviewing um, different definitions that are being used presently. So one of these authors is Operetti and uh, colleagues um, who have identified an evolution in time in this uh, definition. So um, in 1948 with the um, uh, human rights um, declaration, um, a perspective on inclusion was introduced um, yeah, with this, uh, uh, the idea that education uh, should be free and accessible to all. Um, so, and this was a first uh, notion of inclusive education. Then since the 1990s, um, you see an increased focus on students with special needs, students uh, who have disabilities or a handicap. And these are um, and how to include them in education in particular is at the a, at a focus of definitions in that time. And since the years 2000, um, the definition broadens and the focus uh, comes to lie on different kinds of marginalized groups. So not only uh, students with disabilities, but for example, also students who do not speak the instructional language at home or students who are growing up in poverty or students who um, yeah, have a migration background and another cultural or religious uh, background uh, that might be oppressed, etc. And then since the year 2005, we see that the definition has broadened even more. And this idea of education for all is really the standard. Uh, this has become the standard. And it's really um, about creating maximal learning opportunities for all students, and not only those who are vulnerable uh, for some reason, but for all. So you see this shift from a deficiency-based focus on particular groups towards a very broad and more appreciative um, approach on inclusion and education for all. Um, and then at one of the, you also see that some terminology that is being used uh, next to inclusive education is also teaching for diversity, appreciating diversity and uh, terminology like that. Um, and then diversity is in, the, in recent definitions, you see that diversity is really being approached in a very broad sense. And so not only, for example, students with disabilities or students with uh, from ethnic minorities, and, but this idea of intersectionality is really becoming more and more uh, common. Uh, and uh, intersectionality uh, was, is a term first coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, which uh, she was um, uh, a law uh, scientist. Um, and she used this term to, um, yeah, to study the, the interactions between being black and being a woman and being discriminated on these basis. Um, so the origins are uh, black feminism, um, and the idea uh, is that you can never um, reduce a person to only one dimension of uh, the identity, um, and multiple dimensions um, interact, um, and multiple positions of privilege and power or oppression um, interact, and um, yeah, each person has this unique position in this uh, situation. Um, we see that um, 
there is quite there is a gap huh, between this this very broad definition we see there is a consensus about in the academic literature and how national and regional policies are implementing inclusive education uh, in many policy documents inclusion is still um, really focused at um, for example uh, students with disabilities in particular and uh, the focus is not yet on this inclusion for all um, here an example from the uh, M decree, which is um, the decree uh, that arranges inclusive education in Flanders. And there it states that inclusive education aims to increase the relative number of pupils in regular schools and decrease the number of pupils attending special education and special schools. So it's really towards this physical, um, this physical uh, inclusion. Um, and aimed at students with special needs. And many of the documents are really still focused on this issue. Um, another, um, another team of authors that have assessed the existing definitions about inclusion are Goranson and Milvon. Um, and they uh, add an extra category of definitions. And so category A, B, and C are very similar to the ones in the previous model. Uh, at the base, you have um, definitions of inclusion as the physical placement of students within a shared learning environment within a general uh, classroom. Then you have um, a focus on not only the physical uh, inclusion, but on learning and social um, and academic needs of pupils, but uh, of pupils with disabilities in particular. Then we see uh, in the level above, you have, okay, social and academic needs of all students. But then these authors add this category of definitions that focus on the building of communities. And so it goes beyond meeting the needs of individual pupils. It's really about creating environments that are um, hospitable towards um, multiple groups. And in, in, a, in an extra slide, I've just added some extra uh, info to make this more concrete. And for example, uh, it's about communities that nurture qualities of equity and care. It's about classrooms um, that also take into account uh, social histories that were marginalized by dominant groups, uh, oppressed knowledges that are being honored in these and learning environments and different forms of diversity that are being valued. And so it's, it goes beyond these needs of individual students. It's about creating yeah, an environment with a particular set of values um, that is dominant. Um, and then the last um, like categorization of the definitions that I wanted to share with you guys is one of Eng Engsig um, from 2015. And this article talks about the depth of inclusion uh, and it makes a distinction between physical inclusion, which just means like that a student is physically part of the uh, environment. Um, then you have social inclusion um, where, these, uh, where all students are able to actively participate. And then you have the experienced inclusion, which is um, yeah, students also having this sense of belonging and being part of a certain community. So this is also this idea of the previous model. And uh, for example, uh, it could be that certain students from oppressed groups are part of the classroom and are actively participating and are achieving good results. <laughs> but still, they might not feel welcome, they might not feel part of the community, they might feel that others are hostile towards them, that they cannot be themselves, etc. And so this um, is what they would call, then there is a problem with the experienced inclusion. Okay, <laughs> so these were uh, some categorizations of definitions of inclusion. Um, and then besides these definitions, there's also lots of work that has been done around models and um, really indicators that you can use as, a, yeah, as school leaders or 
um, teacher educators and with very fine grained indicators to make these definitions concrete. Um, and what all of what all these um, models have in uh, have in common and similar is that they identify multiple layers to realize inclusive education and that these layers interact with each other. And you have things at the level of an individual, you have, and then you have different communities, and you have the school as an environment, you have the neighborhood, you have um, yeah, municipalities or national authorities, you have cultures, etc. Um, and all of these systems interact. So this complex system um, theory is really present in these models that operationalize inclusion. And one of the models, for example, is index for inclusion. And they identify three dimensions and each dimension has five to 11 indicators. Um, and they identify that you have to create inclusive cultures. And with this, they stress that you have to uh, pay attention to the development of shared values and a collaborative, um, a collaborative culture and community. A uh, second dimension is producing inclusive policies. So you have to translate these goals and these aspirations in concrete plans of action. And you also have to um, invest and provide the necessary support to realize these things. And then the third dimension is the actual practices um, being uh, realized in the student-teacher uh, relationships. Um, and so it's about orchestrating learning environments which are responsive to diversity and also mobilizing other actors um, in the environment uh, to co-create these learning environments and using um, them as resources. So this could be other students, this could be parents, this could be uh, partners in the, in this, in the neighborhood, uh, local communities, etc. And then just to give you an example, I will not go into all of these indicators, but it's to give you an idea, like each of these dimensions has been worked out with a list of indicators. So this is a really fine grained um, and an interesting um, tool to work with. Then another model is uh, of Lorman um, from 2014. And this is a very, uh, a model that is, uh, very nice to manage and assess progress as in an institution towards inclusion because it has a very um, uh, observable, it has a, yeah, a very observable way of um, yeah, describing these indicators. And they identify um, the micro, meso and macro level, which is like the small, uh, teacher child level and the classroom and then the broader school and community level um, and the leadership and then you have input process and output eh, which is like for example how you recruit how you support study progress and what are the outcomes you actually achieve with these students and for each of these fields they have identified several indicators of inclusion which you as a management team you could like go and inventorize for which of these indicators do we already have numbers and can we uh, see where we are and then monitor your progress. And then you have Schwelka and Engsig who have taken this model of um, Lohrmann and they've added another layer of complexity um, and they have made a cube, like 3D cube model in which they ha you have like um, yeah access quality utilities similar to the input process output and then you have micro meso macro but then they add these different communities and this this extra community level and they state that um, yeah students or staff eh, can be included and excluded in certain communities and not in others eh? so. Children might feel included in the child-to-child -child community, but are, maybe they are excluded in the uh, community of school leadership, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so they bring this extra dimension and taking into account these multiple communities where students and staff and parents are part of. 
So we have lots of theories and models, especially all of them emphasizing the great complexity and the interactions between levels uh, to, um, yeah, to be able to realize inclusive education. And there has been a lot of empirical research in the past on inclusive education and on competencies of teachers for inclusive education. And really it's, it has exploded to such a big extent that it, I can imagine it's quite a challenge for teacher educators um, to keep on top of the evidence base. So the study we did um, was um, a review of reviews because there have been performed over 20 reviews on how to train teachers for inclusion already. Um, so this is a lot. Um, and having this focus on how to prepare to teachers for inclusive education is, is a huge challenge and super important. Um, because uh, especially in Flanders, we really have this very strong tradition of segregation um, in our educational system. And the European mean is one and a half to two percent of pupils that are um, attending special schools. And in Flanders, this is five to six percent. Um, we do not have more children with special needs than in other countries. We just um, refer them to separate schools uh, much faster than in other regions. And you also see that in these special schools, boys are, oh, are um, overrepresented. Uh, uh, children from migration backgrounds are overrepresented. Children growing up in poverty are overrepresented. So there's, um, yeah, there's quite some evidence that it's yeah, children uh, who have behavioral issues, um, emotional issues. Um, that are being referred to special education. Uh, we also have a huge gap between this super diverse uh, pupil population and a like predominantly white female teacher uh, uh, corps, uh, teacher um, population. Um, here in this slide, you can see in the dark blue, you see the percentage of teachers with a migration background from certain countries. And in light blue, the, num the percentage of pupils with a migration background from these countries. These data are already 10 years old. Um, in, and it's data from uh, first grade and secondary education, so 12 year old pupils. Um, and it, it's like one of the only things we have, because in Flanders, there's no official data on these topics. So this was one study we did on inclusive education in more than 6,000 pupils and their teachers, and we gathered this data. So we have an idea about um, this cultural gap between students and teachers, but there's no official uh, monitoring on this topic. Um, so, uh, but what we see is that um, in Flanders, uh, the, the main migration background is uh, Moroccan, Turkish, Eastern European. Uh, but like the very few teachers who have a migration background have a mi migration background in the Netherlands, France, um, and Germany, which is like the neighboring countries. And this is like a different migration profile. So there's really this gap between yeah, an increasingly diverse student population and a, a very white um, teacher population. And this is also uh, the reality in uh, Brussels where this gap is even uh, bigger. And with like more than 80% of teachers who teach in Brussels come from outside of Brussels to teach in Brussels and then they go back home in the evening. And then, yeah, so they come to work and they go back home. So there's they are very much uh, not very familiar with the Brussels city and context. Um, also, 17% of Flemish teachers states, only 70%, 17% states they feel competent to teach in multi-diverse contexts. So less than one in five says, I feel competent. Whilst every classroom in Flanders is becoming increasingly multicultural. And um, when uh, we did um, in 2020, earlier this year, we had a conference for Flemish teacher educators and the teacher educators that were present there, they filled in a questionnaire and only one in four 
teacher educators said they felt competent to prepare student teachers to teach in multicultural contexts. So also in the teacher education population, teacher educators don't feel competent and teachers themselves also don't. So there's really this huge need uh, to learn and grow um, in this regard. Um, what is an additional challenge um, is the fact that in the in most disadvantaged regions that need the, uh, the most qualified teachers, because there's lots of challenges that need to be um, addressed, um, schools in those neighborhoods are working with the least experienced teachers. And Flanders is at the at the yeah is the has the lowest percentage of experienced teachers in disadvantaged schools of all OECD uh, countries, um, and this is really a sad reality that we see in Brussels um, daily. Uh, teachers working in the Brussels schools do not have teacher education or or have only one or a few years of experience. And once they have a few years of experience, they leave Brussels to go and teach. Um, we say under the kerktoren and uh, back in the in their little village <laughs> in uh, Flanders. Um, so great challenges. Um, teachers that do not feel competent and the least competent, least experienced teachers working in the most challenging contexts. So. Um, we felt there's really a need to make accessible the knowledge that there is about how to prepare student teachers for um, inclusive education. Um, and because when we were looking into the topic in the literature, we found many review studies that had already been done. Um, so what we did uh, was um, identify the systematic reviews and meta-analysis that have already been performed in the past um, on how to train teachers for inclusive education. And we summarized uh, these results um, and we summarized them in 10 principles for effective teacher education for inclusive education. So this is just um, a visual of our first search phase, which we performed in April, May, 2020. So this is the, the, yeah, the method with which we searched the uh, databases, Web of Science, ERIC, ResearchGate, Google Scholar, and Scopus. And we ended up, after including and excluding based on a set of criteria, we ended up with 15 review studies on this topic. And we performed a new search in December 2021. And this um, uh, yielded an extra 11 uh, systematic reviews. That, so in total, we have 26 uh, systematic reviews that have been published previously on this topic of how to prepare teachers for inclusive education. Um, so we've gone through all of these um, review studies and we summarized the takeaway messages. Um, one of the things we did was um, summarize all of the attitudes, knowledges, and skills that these articles mentioned that were crucial to teach um, to student teachers. Um, and we departed from the concept of competences in which you have uh, attitudes and values, and then you also have knowledges which are reproducible, and then you have skills, and it's how to do things in practice. Um, and yeah, I will not read them all. Uh, you will have the slides. Um, they will be sent and made available, uh, but you can see there's a huge range of topics that has been identified as important uh, competences for inclusive teaching, ranging from reflective practices and knowing your own identity and uh, being conscious of your uh, prejudice um, and the knowledge base ranges from psychological frameworks, sociological frameworks, philosophical, political, uh, uh, etc. And then you have also a set of skills like communication skills, um, research skills, 
collaboration skill set. So this is the first thing we did. And what we noticed also when reviewing the reviews is that the vast majority of studies and reviews were focusing on attitudes. So most of the research has been done about teacher thinking about inclusion and the knowledge that is necessary and the skills that need to be developed and how to develop them. There's much less um, evidence base around these uh, topics, which is not a surprise because that's methodologically more uh, difficult and more labor intensive to study than attitudes and teacher thinking, which you can just like measure with a survey or an interview, which is a very common method. But if you want to study skills, you would have to go and observe, and this is a very costly and uh, time intensive method. Um, but it is interesting because there are some studies, like many, um, many studies seem to depart from the idea that you first want to change teacher thinking, and this will then result in a change of teacher behavior in classroom, and this will result in increased uh, learning opportunities for pupils. But there are indications in the evidence base that the other way around is also a valid way of working. And the, like in the PhD of Vicky Williams, uh, we also noticed this, that sometimes we see that when teachers see and analyze how their pupils learn, they become aware of, ah, it was this and this practice that triggered this learning. Well, maybe I should include this more in my behavior. And then they see that it works. And then because they see that it works in practice, they change their belief system and they change their attitudes. And actually, if you go and look into the literature about uh, theories of change and how teacher professional learning occurs, um, all of these models have these, um, these arrows going in both directions, but still much empirical research focuses only on the direction from thinking towards behavior and not in the other way around. So we feel that there is really great potential in investigating this other, um, uh, in the other direction of the causality as well. And then we found 10 principles um, of an effective teacher education curriculum for inclusive education. A first one that really popped out in almost all of the studies is the fact that attention for inclusion should be integrated in the curriculum from the beginning to the end. And also not just in one course, but actually in all courses. It should not be something isolated. It has to be um, yeah, part of the culture and the community. Um, so that one was the first one. The second one is um, having attention for inclusive recruitment and study progress. Um, yeah, we should be able to create um, yeah, recruitment and selection procedures in which we ourselves have attention towards yeah, diverse profiles, diverse needs, um, possible biases we have when selecting and recruiting, um, et cetera. Also, there's lots of studies focusing on the fact that um, we should have and attract more diverse teachers. We should attract more teachers with a migration background, for example, or linguistic uh, diverse um, background. Um, and we see in research that these profiles tend to opt for teaching of more often as a second career than a first career. So there's some research suggesting to focus heavily on second career teaching paths and training second career teachers as a strategy to increase the diversity of the teacher population. So that's also mm -hmm. something, uh, if we want to have a more diverse teacher population, uh, we should uh, yeah, focus on programs that are feasible for working students who want to change careers and not only focus on the ones who choose to become a teacher as their initial study choice. A third uh, element we found, uh, no surprise, uh, is uh, critical inquiry and self-reflection. Um, yeah, a lot of authors um, stress the fact that 
uh, dealing with diversity in classrooms and providing opportunities for all is just yeah impossible if you do not adopt um, an inquiry stance. It's not about uh, reading some tips and tricks and simply implementing them. You really have to go back and forth between abstract theories and what we know works from evidence and empirical research and seeing how you can implement this in a particular setting with knowledge of the context um, of learners and the environment and possibilities in the school, etc. cetera. Um, and this is only possible if you follow some sort of an inquiry cycle. So this is also recurrent, you see, and there's lots of models, action research, lesson study, practitioner research, communities of practice, etc. But the basic idea is this inquiry stands in the following of a systematic inquiry cycle and self-reflection. A fourth element is mentoring and coaching, um, especially if you, um, uh, if you put students of teachers in authentic learning contexts, they will also see lots of counterproductive examples and models around them. Um, they will see teachers who are exhausted and are not uh, performing well, or, um, yeah, or, or they will see someone doing a certain thing in one classroom and they will think, oh, I can simply copy it and do the same in my classroom. Um, so it's, and, and then they lose this responsiveness to the particular ele elements of their class. So what's crucial and what is being stressed throughout the studies is the fact that we need mentoring and coaching before practice and internships, during and after. And then it's no problem. And like there's also this discussion about should we um, have student teachers training in special training schools that only model like the good example, or do we place and in authentic school settings where they also see not so good models of teaching. Um, and it's okay to put them in authentic settings if you provide the appropriate mentoring, because then these examples can be a very valuable source of uh, critical reflection and analysis. Um, voilà. A fifth element, um, is community-based learning. And I think with the visits we had here in, uh, in Sergi today, I think we really saw how this can be made uh, a reality. Eh? So it's being stressed that um, yeah, you should not teach student teachers in a decontextualized way. Uh, you should prepare them and, and model and make them familiar with these collaborations with the community and uh, uh, giving them opportunities to co-create learning environments together with these relevant uh, stakeholders. So this community-based learning is also recurrent. Then a sixth one is a teacher education uh, continuum or lifelong learning and the fact that teachers when receiving their diploma, they will not be done learning how to become an inclusive. Siri. <laughs> uh, Siri thought I was looking for a toilet, <laughs> but I wasn't. So, um, where was I? Ah, yeah. Uh, so, and they will not be done learning about how to become inclusive teachers. Also, a lot of the knowledge about certain special needs and how to include them in education is is still being built at the moment. There's not yet a consolidated um, knowledge base on certain topics and issues such as multilingual education. And that, like every year there's new insights. And so teachers will have to continue learning. And um, as a teacher education institution, we should prepare teachers for this lifelong learning, but also uh, take up of responsibility in training in service teachers and school leaders. Um, because if we only uh, train the new teachers and like the sitting teachers, uh, yeah, are not being professionalized enough, eh, then the transition will be slow. And so we should uh, collaborate with uh, services uh, that do in service teacher training to make this transition uh, faster. 
collaboration, and this is something that has already been a part of other um, indicators and principles as well. Um, but obviously, uh, um, given the fact that this inclusive challenge is so diverse with so many layers and, and systems um, that are having to do with it, uh, it's not a single teacher it, that can create an inclusive learning environment. So you have to uh, collaborate um, with people who have experience or expertise, um, who specialize in certain topics, um, who add voices that you do not have, etc. So this collaboration with teachers within schools, there's a lot of research being done on this topic. Less is known about how to support collaboration with uh, people outside of the school, which is also crucial uh, for inclusive education. Safe spaces. If we want student teachers to fundamentally uh, inquire into their own knowledge and beliefs, if we want them to um, yeah, doubt themselves in a fundamental way um, and see themselves from a different perspective and do this in a critical way, then we have to provide safe spaces. We have to create environments uh, where students can feel completely free to speak their minds and think um, without being judged on this. And so we need to create some spaces where they can make mistakes, where they can say the wrong things um, without them being immediately judged on this. Um, usually this is being created in reflection sessions um, and then not having an evaluative function for these uh, reflection sessions, for example. Um, but also there's examples of really like physical spaces where students can uh, do activities that are maybe extracurricular, um, where they can yeah, reflect on their identity or whatever. And then special needs. Um, there has also been some research into should we focus on like the whole list of uh, identity uh, characteristics that students can have and how to deal with them, like autism, HDAD, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, gender diversity, uh, et cetera. And should we focus on all of these things individually or should we keep it more general? Um, and literature shows that um, only doing the general is not enough. And if you only teach your student teachers about what is inclusion in general, um, that is not enough. You always also, it's more effective if you also add um, in-depth knowledge about particular um, special needs and these uh, knowledge frameworks. And then the last one is about the use of technology. There's quite some research, it was not so much, but it's very, it looks very promising about how we can use technology to improve the way we train student teachers. Uh, and like there is multiple um, interesting pathways. For example, the use of video in reflection sessions, because video allows to bring this complex reality of a classroom in the reflection session. Um, which allows for a much richer reflection than if it's only based on the, the um, uh, yeah, what someone has, um, mem yeah, on someone's memory or a written report of this. And so if you bring this video into the classroom, um, it's a much more powerful way of reflecting on uh, how to deal with diversity in the classroom. Um, also, one of the, another uh, interesting example was using, um, like a digital um, uh, digital role playing uh, to train uh, parents conversations, um, and this is something that in Flanders, in any case, uh, is uh, uh, difficult for students to train during teacher education and to do these conversations with parents. Many schools do not want student teachers to do these things, uh, but it's really crucial for inclusive education. So colleagues in Ghent, for example. Uh, um, did an experiment with digital role playing with actors to train uh, parents' uh, conversations. Um, and you also, uh, there's another study I recall where missing voices were brought in into the course via digital materials. And so it wasn't possible to invite all of these speakers 
Yeah, but then uh, they they entered these things digitally in the course, um, and this way you have much more perspectives present in the course. So these are the ten uh, principles we identified in the literature um, as things to keep in mind uh, when designing the curriculum for teacher education programs. Um, and as uh, as a discussion and reflection, what I prepared is um, uh, a method with all of these ten criteria. And my suggestion would be that you go to the Padlet um, and you rate each of the ten. Can you copy the oh, yeah. actually uh, copy, uh, copy, copy paste the link in the in the in the discussion in the chat discussion, yeah. so that uh, we can all get to it. Let's see. I will uh, copy the link in the. Um, oops. I already have the link. Which slide was it? <coughs> Here we go. So. so you can scan the QR code or you can go to the link. Um, and then you can rate the 10 principles, like in my teacher education program, do I feel that we are doing this um, very weakly, weak, not weak, not, not really strong, or we're strong at this, or we're very strong at this. And it's, yeah, it's your perspective. Um, if you feel, I really don't know, I suggest you just don't rate this item. Um, but if you do have like an idea, it's nice to see where we think we are already performing well and where we could still improve. And I'll also go to the tablets. And of course, like the floor is open for questions and discussion and reactions. Um. Thank you very much, <laughs> despite the problem we had. Um, it depends if you want that we go further into this exercise now or if we can go. I don't know. Yeah, I was looking at the time. I don't know what the you're, 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 you're great. We still have almost one hour of questions and discussion, which is what we usually do. Yeah. Fine for me. Um, I prepared something like that tomorrow for tomorrow morning, so I <laughs> um, hope it's fine. Uh, and I have plenty of questions, but um, maybe people who won't see El tomorrow morning have other questions. Um, maybe people can just si raise their hand. Si you questions, uh, tout à fait. Uh, Levez la main sur, sur dans réaction, vous avez la possibilité de lever la main normalement. Et vous pouvez, voilà, comme Marc est en train de vous signaler, poser des questions en français ou en anglais. Euh, moi, j'ai beaucoup de questions. Je ne veux pas non plus monopoliser la parole, mais j'ai profité que les gens ne sont pas encore défilés. Euh, pour commencer. Euh, so I had a question on uh, uh, about the reviews you did. Um, what what uh, which level they were what they were studying? They were studying primary school, middle school, high school, university level, and is it the same or is there something depending on the level? Um, we. Uh, only focused on compulsory education. So studies in higher education, we did not include. So primary and secondary. Um, I don't really think if we, we didn't really see any major differences being discussed between primary and secondary. 
but like yeah we've also done research into inclusive education in flanders and in our empirical research in flanders we see that attitudes towards inclusion and even inclusive practices are more integrated in primary schools than in secondary schools the culture of collaboration is much uh yeah is is that there's a better departing point for collaboration um uh, in primary education and also like the um, how teachers rate their own competencies is also uh, higher. Mm -hmm. The study was only in Flanders? This is the study I'm now talking, no, no, yeah. the, the review of reviews there yeah. we didn't find any uh, differences that were being systematically reported about between primary and secondary but in Flanders we see in Flanders that in, in primary um, the situation is more positive than in secondary education. And did you notice any country or cultural things that you seem to change depending on where it is? No, I guess this wasn't really the, the focus of the studies hasn't really been this, this uh, comparative perspective. I guess it's also difficult to compare regions with regards to inclusion because really the policies are very diverse and uh, um yeah i know in flanders where we just it's really dramatic we have a very weak culture of collaboration we have a very high percentage of referral towards special schools from the minute a student has like yeah, behavioral issues um also like our government has waited until the ultimate last moment that they had to uh, implement inclusive education. They had already ratified um, much earlier, but they really waited 10 years before implementing it. And now with the new government, they even turned, they even took a step back and the number of students in inclusive education is ri uh, in separate schools is rising again. So it's really going the, not in the right direction. But uh, the studies we reviewed, there wasn't really this, com this comparative perspective. And we also didn't take this perspective to analyze it from a com uh, comparative uh, point of view. Maybe if you, yeah, maybe if you take all the studies and you really perform an analysis with this focus, maybe you will, might find some um, some differences, but it wasn't a focus. Yeah, maybe. Well, I just want to add that when you look at the, can you speak louder? Because I don't think they can hear. Are you you check on your? I'm gonna. It will echo. Yeah, or you come here to talk to the back I speak louder. <laughs> I just want to add that the uh, articles that we that were reviewed were mostly based uh, in the region uh, of the US. So if you look at diversity there, they mainly talk about cultural diversity. So that's I think mm -hmm. um, if, we, yeah, if you look at comparisons, I think that that's one uh, that you can see that it's mostly uh, about cultural diversity yeah. students and how to they will just uh, something uh, maybe they, I don't, they don't hear you so maybe I will repeat yeah, yeah. yeah that's true so Helene was just saying that when we began searching for inclusive education mm -hmm. dealing with diversity preparing teachers like the majority of research is it was anglo-saxon but this also has to do with the um, yeah with the with the databases we use yeah? um, and mm -hmm. the focus of research has predominantly been on uh, in cultural diversity and dealing with cultural diversity um, in the in these Anglo-Saxon countries and how to prepare teachers to deal with cultural diversity. Uh, Marlene Martin has a kind of uh, polemic remark. Mm -hmm. uh, Marlene, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I don't have the chat open, so... Okay, I, I'm going to read what she says. It's in French. Uh, I know my own does speak English. Uh, so she says, Merci pour cette présentation. L'école inclusive est une exigence éthique, mais il me semble qu'on surestime parfois ses possibilités. Uh, okay. Uh, 
if she cannot. Uh, uh, so I will translate it by uh, science for this presentation. Uh, intuitive schooling is a uh, um, phonetical demand, but uh, we overestimate the possibilities of it, unfortunately. Uh, despite lots of uh, training and everything we can do, all difficulties mm -hmm. cannot be overcome, mm -hmm. and it's a reality uh, which some families uh, have trouble to hear, mm -hmm. and which is painful for teachers. Um, I yeah, I concur, and like some authors even state that inclusion is like a utopia. It's like something we aspire, but we know it will never be fully realized. Like complete, complete equity. Like we know that this is it's very difficult to imagine that this will one day become the true reality. So it's like, but still, and this is also something that is being stressed in research that um, as teachers, we have to uh, maintain our belief that it is possible and that we can have impact and it, that we can have a positive, uh, we can make a difference. Because having this stance, this growth mindset, this positive utopian thinking, teachers who have this are more effective and realize better learning outcomes in their pupils. So it's like, it's difficult, but we know that reality is sometimes, like sometimes you see children and you know like, you know, this will be very difficult to get them to learn this or that, but still it's our moral duty to be optimistic because having this stance and having high expectations, believing in ourselves, believing in these pupils, believing in the small possibility that we, in this situation, we might, yes, have an impact and it can change. Having this um, mindset makes us more effective teachers. <coughs> so, yeah, it's like a doctor who will do, uh, who will operate on someone. If he knows the success rates are only 10%, he will not begin the operation like, oh, it will not work, you know, but hey, I, no, they begin the operation thinking this will be the one that works. And I think in teachers, it's the same having this mindset, even though we know it's like, even we know then how difficult it is to change these systematic inequalities and, and discriminations. Um, we know it's not easy, but we have to believe we can make a difference. And we must not become cynical, I think, because we are more effective teachers if we are utopian and optimistic and maybe um, naive. So I think because Malen is in a, in a transportation, so but so, so she replied only to me, and she said, "Of course, everything that can be should be, but so this leads to false hope or the idea that we don't adapt ourselves enough." Um, yeah, and this I don't I don't think so because this is also this inquisitive stance. I think um, it's not just like this false hope. It's knowing the evidence base and knowing that having this uh, optimistic view will make us more effective teachers. But at the same time, knowing that we have influence, but also the influence has its limits. And then at the end of the day, also being able to see this complex system and understanding that we and our influence is only one of the elements, but it's the one element we have influence on. So I think we should do whatever we can with this, but then also when necessary, see the bigger picture. So it's about, and I think this is complex and this is not easy to train teachers in to have this understanding of this complex system and knowing that yes, we can have an influence, but yes, it's also limited. Um, yeah. Uh, what she says is from the teacher's point of view, which is the point of view of this seminar, you know, she understands, but then uh, Marlene is uh, leading a laboratory school, mm -hmm. so she, she, she is in touch with all the parents as well, mm -hmm. and she says the communication with the parents is hard, mm -hmm. and it's not only, uh, as you say, there is that community-based mm -hmm. training, and it's not only, and as we say this morning, it's also all the co-education, 
and um, yeah. so at one point I guess we have to take that into account as well. Yeah, and I think this is really something lots of teacher education institutes are really struggling with still. Um, I think we know we should be more community based, but to bring this into practice is difficult, especially since we are not being funded to being this outreaching. Um, like this is also, we're also part of this um, Flex Labs in Utopia, which is about, yeah reaching out towards yeah, community and lifelong learning and but all of these partnerships with parents neighborhoods basically in flanders the university is not being funded for these things so it's under pressure um, and this really is a challenge yeah and um, i can only concur that this is very difficult and it's also, yeah, you can have teacher, you can bring teachers to see this complexity, but we should also, yeah, work with all the other stakeholders and, and parents and pupils themselves and to try and see this, this complexity. But yeah, I can only agree that this is a big challenge. Um, and I think there's still lots of work to be done. Well, so to say yeah. to to agree with you about uh, yeah. uh, communication with uh, parents. Yeah. Yeah, and especially I don't know how it is in your regions, uh, but in in Flanders, really, the many schools do not want to say that student teachers communicate with parents, um, and then it's difficult to have students train these skills. Eh? So. I'm very surprised. I'm looking at, uh, I mean, it's only like uh, six to eight people who mm -hmm. answered, but the grade are very <laughs> so high. high. I, I, was, and, I was surprised as well. Very, so, so there is that, uh, it seems like most of us think that uh, <laughs> we're doing great. <laughs> we're doing great for inclusion. Well, actually, that gives some optimism <laughs> somehow. And after what we saw, Maybe we are optimistic. Uh, we just saw a classroom <laughs> in which we couldn't guess who were the kids with special needs because they were so well included that we just don't know. Uh, I mean, if you know, tell me and you can hear my thing because some of us don't know. Um, <coughs> any other question? I still have plenty, but I don't want to monopolize. Uh, moi, j'ai une question. Um, and uh, I will ask my, ask my question in, in French. It's uh, easier for me. Um, vous dites que uh, la technologie favorise um, les progrès en formation. Um, et je, je, je vous remercie beaucoup uh, de... De, de votre présentation et d'avoir insisté euh, sur ce point. Et je, je voudrais savoir comment vous avez mesuré euh, ces, ces effets de la technologie euh, sur la formation. Um, so it's not we who measured the effect. So it's something that was described in the systematic reviews and in the meta analysis that we reviewed and summarized. Um, so uh, it was like, it was only a few of the reviews that mentioned this and really discussed uh, in particular on the use of technology um, to prepare teachers for inclusion. Um, but yeah, but do you know how they, how they did uh, in this uh, review to, uh, to measure this uh, progress? Uh, it depends. Uh, some of the reviews, because it's, yeah, the reviews summarize empirical studies. And so each empirical study had their own methods to measure these things. And then the review study summarized, sometimes it's more narrative, sometimes it's a meta-analysis where, where they really do quantitative analysis on the quantitative data of the underlying studies. So it differs, we, should, we, we would have to dive into uh, this particular review studies uh, again. I can't tell you. Okay. Okay. Um, 
but we, if you're interested in this uh, dimension, we can give you the reviews that uh, talked about this, uh, this particular uh, topic. Um, okay. And that each of these reviews summarized underlying individual studies. Um, but yeah, and and also, thank you. Uh, uh, we just did a study about uh, uh, hybridization of the uh, training that shows exactly that, mm -hmm. the same. So it's only one study uh, here in Geneva, <laughs> uh, no, actually in Anthony. But, uh, and the reason, the explanation we had is that they learn how to use uh, digital tools and work collectively at a distance, and that, that's something they keep and transfer uh, to, the, to the kids. Like, they, they, they learn how to organize the collective document, like a framaval or whatever, and then they use it or they learn how to use a, a WhatsApp group to prepare things together with teachers, and then they work more collaboratively and, and they transfer it. And I, I think that uh, our colleagues from uh, VUB, I mean, two of them are doing PhD on collaborative teachers, more or less, of studies, um, if I understood correctly, and you can confirm it. But they, they were showing that kind of stuff. So it, it seemed like my understanding was that technology equipped people to be more collaborative so that it imposed all the rest. Yeah, I, that's one way, like it's, it's multiple ways. Um, that's one way it can be used, but also we saw it as a method to really uh, bring in some knowledge frameworks, for example, from minority, like um, I was in, um, in a, a doctoral committee of uh, someone who used a digital platform um, to bring in the stories of native um, communities of that country and uh, to yeah, bring these portraits and these voices um, in the course uh, for students to be familiar with the histories of different subpopulations in the country. Because it's like, it was like in France, uh, government decides uh, you will go and become a teacher there and there and there. And sometimes student teachers would be sent out to, to communities, very uh, sometimes native, uh, communities with, from which they really knew nothing about, so in the um, that are very isolated, and it's not possible to bring all these people as guest speakers into the course. But what they did was bring all of these voices and the histories and, and information about these subcultures and bring this into the course in a digital way and having them working with these voices and materials. So it's really a different. And also like the or like the role playing um, with um, with actors in a digital setting uh, to train per parent conversations to explain things and with different scenarios and so so it's really very I th I found it very creative um, out of the box sometimes these these ideas about how we can use technology for inclusive education and to train teachers. And the methods that they used were different. Sometimes it's really like a quasi-experimental design with knowledge tests. Um, sometimes it's more case studies. Um, yeah, it depends on huh, the type of evidence. Yeah. Uh, I, there is a nice question in the chat uh, saying that uh, there is a theory estimating that uh, technology is a major factor for inclusion, but also uh, it uh, problem in terms of equity mm -hmm. and uh, chances of global neutrality. Uh, so, how can we fix it? Yeah, and uh, of course, I think in, um, in higher education, students that are studying to become teachers, like a lot of students from vulnerable groups have already fallen out. Eh? And the ones that are reaching higher education um, like the, the issues of accessibility to technology are smaller than in compulsory education, but still present. And I do feel that I think universities in general have some policies about making these technologies more inclusive also. Um, but I don't know if, if programs themselves really think about this so much. In our teacher education program, we don't really have 
active reflection about the question, well, we are beginning these reflections now about the way we use technology in our blended programs. Is this actually inclusive? Because we notice, especially for this site entry group, so we have people who are 40, 50 years sometimes um, have been uh, working in a sector that they have not been using technology a lot. And then they come in at our university to train, to become a teacher. And they have, you know, they have one week time to get familiar with five to six different platforms. And immediately from week one, they have to collaborate with other students uh, who are, you know, who are already familiar with all these things because they have already studied for five years at university and we see them really struggling. So we see there's this, um, there's this significant group of site entry students of teaching who are falling behind because of the, the, the amount of technology we use in our program. And so we have just um, begun to see this very clearly also with the COVID COVID pandemic, of course, um, and we are now thinking about how we can deal with this. Um, yeah, so, but we don't have an answer yet. So, but yeah, this is, uh, and I think it's with many things, eh, they, like technology in the end is a tool which can have positives and opportunities, but also negatives and challenges. And, Finding a way to balance them is uh, not easy, but we will have to find. Slavica, um, do you want to turn on your mic and ask a question, or do you want me to ask it? Uh, hi to everyone. Yes, thank you. I can ask questions uh, um, by myself. Uh, well, thank you for a very nice presentation. I had something in my mind. Um, like, uh, do you think that uh, technology enhanced learning research community can do uh, a better job in supporting uh, teachers in their education, but also in their teaching activities in respect to those 10 characteristics that you listed? And I would personally uh, like to know very much what would be your like recommendation for the community? Like what would be the most crucial uh, direction for research and development? That's a big question. I don't know if I can give you an answer right now. Um, I'm thinking about conversations we had recently about this topic as well. Eh? Um, like we, we, I did a couple of weeks ago, I was um, a guest lecture at, uh, at one of the partners in the Utopia. And it's students who are designing digital learning environments. And one thing I learned from them was that the main challenge is how to build online and digital learning environments that still maintain a level of personalization and that are not completely abstract. And, and especially for the topic of inclusive education, this is important, I think, yeah, if you want to train teachers in a digital environment for inclusive education, how do we not lose this authenticness and this focus for individuals and persons and, and, and not see it simply as something abstract, a story here or there. So how do we, so I think this is really a challenge um, for them. Like when I was uh, interacting with those students, they immediately saw this as a challenge. Um, so as for example, one of the things we were contemplating about is, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could um, make these virtual walks in different neighborhoods and have students with virtual reality go on these walks and then they would have um, a, a student, a pupil from a certain school explaining, this is me, this is my life, this is where I live. I walk to school in this way and in my school you find this and that and then having some different perspectives and seeing this great diversity, like different lives of pupils that are attending schools in Brussels or in schools in Paris or in schools in other uh, cities, et cetera. And then, uh, but then the challenge is how do you, yeah, it's like, it's not fiction. Eh? How do you keep this real and authentic? And um, so, 
yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting questions to be asked in this regard, uh, but maybe like um, one that is important is how do you keep it personal and how do you do not decontextualize too much in trying to make it digital. But I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in technology, so I think yeah. it would yeah, be interesting I, I, to I ask. Actually, I, I asked in private, mm -hmm. Larissa, isn't uh, what you do postdoc? <laughs> then you said yes. So I think it's it, interesting it, to yeah. brainstorm with technology it, experts yeah. and yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's something we should work on um, mm -hmm. in our community. Thanks a lot for raising up that question. Uh, Marta has a question, and I know you answered yes, so it's not really a question. Is can you send us the geographic <laughs> references on this topic yeah. uh, of the effect of technology in training? I'm very interested, as you know, mm -hmm. in that question too. And, uh, Sure. Maybe this can be like a, a sub project in our learning community that yeah. we make like a folder in our yeah. learning community uh, in, with in a research community. Yeah, in a research yeah. community, a folder with studies yeah. on like yeah, yeah. could be an interesting. Uh, yeah. um, but the seminar is not only concerning our research community. <laughs> so. Uh, let's be inclusive towards any, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. any person. Uh, if there is no question, then I go on with mine. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you noticed maybe one, two, let's say three specific um, dispositions, things uh, like that they review and you review their review and at one point there is like one that seems like wow that seems really great uh, that you could share as a qualitative example of something that uh, you observed and that fulfill uh, all the criteria or maybe that doesn't but that seems a really interesting experience or research you mean like a, a a practice, a good yeah. practice? No, uh, or like, I mean, like, for instance, the review, the qualitative, uh, I don't know, experimental teachers, I don't exactly mm. know what there was in the review, but I guess at one point there was something like what we saw today. There were like some teacher in front of, of pupils trying to, to teach something in a way that makes it sounds more inclusive than usual or less inclusive than usual but my my question was that if you have noticed maybe at least one or maybe two or three specific experiments that make you think hey maybe that could inspire people i would be willing to, to hear i mean if you remember of, because i see you <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, so if you are thinking of something you can Welcome. I think that Chris has left the microphone. Can you can you come here to talk? Or? No. Well, yeah, yeah she can, of course. And so also, you. Uh, can you want to ask her to Or you can come with us. You can come. Yeah, yeah, you can. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so she made the study as well, so you're totally interested. I, uh, I just want to say that because it's a review of a review, that the review studies that we read and summarized into these principles um, are actually also already a, that they also are talking about principles that they saw in individual studies. So it's not that we really read good practices or practices of experiments that were inspirational because the review studies that we read were already a summary of uh, how we can, uh, yeah, yeah maybe point out any specific yeah, things I'm thinking of because um, I think if there is a meta mm. study at one point they say this study shows this and this one yeah. shows this and and so mm. maybe they explain why maybe in a sentence that they yeah. somehow do an abstract of what has been done. Most of the studies, like there's say hierarchy and not a hierarchy, but like the the main. Uh, review studies 
or talking about integration of the curriculum. So I think if you look at uh, most important, I don't want to say most important, but most studies were saying that the integration part is very important so that you have a curriculum who's taking diversity or inclusion through the whole curriculum uh, over the years, but also in all courses. I think that that's one of the principles that were mostly uh, uh, I think that's one. Mm. It was not something specific. No. But not that yeah, I remember. Maybe it's also like we weren't reading <laughs> yeah. the studies with this perspective. We yeah. were trying, we were really trying to like see the, 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 the similarities and the yeah. in a more birds. So maybe if we, we reread these reviews yeah. with another perspective, there might pop some of these things. Yeah. But I think if you go snowballing into the studies that they are mentioning, you can find them as well. Yeah, for me, the surprising part was this technology. Yeah. I wasn't really that aware of the possibilities there. And I think there's great possibilities. Other yeah. questions? I still go on with mine. <laughs> um, I, I, I was, the other question is uh, of something I had was uh, about something you just put previously and uh, I, I was wondering uh, if you could deeper uh, the links with the collaborative teaching uh, and maybe the research of your colleagues that you saw, uh, that were, we had a, an overview mm -hmm. in five minutes this yeah. morning. <laughs> yeah, so this collaboration is really key to realizing inclusive education um, because as the review of the reviews also shows, you really need to have knowledge. Uh, it's not only a question of certain attitudes and beliefs and certain thinking, you also have, you also need to have knowledge and skills. And also these knowledge and skills need to be subject specific. So yeah, there's, if you want to create an inclusive environment for, um, yeah, it's dependent on, yeah, you saw all the uh, you saw all the the knowledge frameworks. It's a lot there. Eh? It's from decolonization to ethical uh, frameworks, and with the with the study volume that is today and uh, present in teacher education institutions, it's not feasible to make each teacher an expert in all of these dimensions and topics. So you really need to look at competences for inclusive education, not as something that is present within an individual teacher, but as something that is present within a teacher team. And you need to team up um, and um, collaborate and specialize in certain topics and create learning environments together, taking all of these aspects in account. Um, and this is really necessary to be inclusive to all. Um, so if you if you work isolated as a teacher, you within your classroom, it will never be possible to be inclusive. It's just, uh, yeah. And and also in in um, I think this is also one uh, next to the um, integration uh, element. This is something that is really dominant in all of the studies. Um, that to create, and especially in the studies that are experimental, uh, where they try to uh, implement a certain uh, practice and then assess the effective the effects of it, um, collaboration between teachers and with, uh, within the school, but also with partners outside of the school, it's recurrent. It's always an, an, a part of the design. Um, so, yeah, because it's just, yeah, as an individual, you cannot meet all of these diverse needs by yourself. Um, it's too much to design and to reflect and to. Uh, Matt says, uh, 
but we can say it. Uh, I agree, it's always the question of the interdependence of mm. pedagogy and didactics. Mm. Um, well, I'm, I'm going on. <laughs> Please feel if you have any question in the room or online. Please, uh, you can really uh, ask something. Um, and uh, well, uh, another question, and I'm more, uh, I'm not so sure I understood it correctly, um, but it's a question that. Um, uh, the, the mentoring and coaching question is something that's uh, what there's something we do here which is called formation formateur so training the teacher's mm -hmm. educator and the position as a mentor uh, is something that uh, they often ask about and um, I was uh, wondering but also that uh, uh, most of them, let's say there are two, two parts. One is the teachers that are on site, mm -hmm. that will be the mentor. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. there are the teachers who are here mm -hmm. yeah. at mm -hmm. the university and mm -hmm. they won't feel like they have any mentoring or coaching to do, which I think is a mistake mm -hmm. actually. Uh, but I think that most of them uh, don't think that they have something to do about it. And I think that some of them, if they had, they wouldn't feel legitimate to be teaching because they would feel like, who am I to teach teachers? Because some of them are like uh, mm -hmm. PhD students uh, mm -hmm. or uh, contractual, uh, they have just a contract. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that uh, mentoring and yeah. coaching during yeah. the training. Yeah, that's and, uh, 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 yeah. That's interesting because I think in Flanders it's a very similar situation. We have um, in-service teachers who are mentoring students at the school, and then we have teacher educators in the institution in the university. Um, but we do, we have more like lecturers and also mentors also in the in university. Um, and we don't really see it as, you know, the challenge in mentoring and coaching is you have to try to integrate theory and practice. And um, you don't have to integrate these two yourself to be able to mentor someone. Um, you can also support the process of going back and forth between theory and practice if you yourself do not have this practical experience per se, um, but students and students get input from their mentor in the school, from uh, fellow students who are doing practical internships, um, from the teacher educators. At our university, we have many teacher educators who combine a job as a teacher and as a teacher educator in the university. We have, um, and we have like educational scientists who are um, sometimes theoretically trained completely and do not have experience as a teacher in, in schools, uh, but who support this reflection, this inquiry process of, of putting all of these perspectives together and making meaning and comparing and, and switching perspective, like take the perspective of a pupil, take the perspective of of uh, this video you made of yourself and, and uh, what is a fellow student saying, what is your mentor saying, what is literature and what is a theory saying, etc. So it's not, it's, I think it's about how you see the role. And if you see the role as, um, as someone who is saying how you have to do it, no, it's not that kind of mentoring. It's the mentoring of supporting the integration of theory and practice and going back and forth between them by using the systematic inquiry cycle. And in this role, um, yeah, also other profiles can take this role to support this process of reflection. You, you specifically mentioned the counterproductive model, which is so true. I have in mind uh, <laughs> during the case study 
so the, the situation was that uh, there was a fight during the class. And when he asked his colleagues, most of his colleagues say he did not do anything wrong. It's the university who is teaching, which is teaching you wrong. And I mean, it's okay to have some reassurance. I mean, you know, it's normal that they feel some mm. solidarity with him, but he wasn't helped <laughs> at any point. He was just told that it's normal, like the system is uh, problematic. Uh, you cannot do anything mm -hmm. about it. So he was not on power with this Anton model at any moment. Mm -hmm. Um, it's usually what was happening a few years ago for any gender problem. Like, well, it's normal. Uh, I remember in you know, Europe 10 years ago when they would say it's normal, women are cooking and, and don't. And it was just normal. They would say, I mean, the students would say it's normal, so let's keep it like this. Um, uh, did you find uh, explanation or how it would work? Mm -hmm. on, because uh, the problem with that counterproductive models is that they're kind of strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this. That's the like the classic uh, theory practice gap thing. Yeah, and um, after what was I going to say? So yeah, we see this a lot as well. Um, and we see that um, when does learning occur, you need safety, but also you need this being um, creative turmoil. You also need to have this unease and sometimes. Um, and changing perspective is crucial in this. And okay, this can be a valuable experience since it's another perspective. So if you have the student coming into a reflection session discussing about this incident of the uh, of this, I don't know, what was it, aggressive behavior or um, then actually like the, the teacher educator should be able to um, support the student in bringing together multiple perspectives. Okay, so we have this mentor saying this is the cause. Okay. What are other possible causes? What is maybe fellow students saying? What is your teacher educator uh, who is teaching the didactic saying? What is the literature that you've read saying? And putting this together and then making meaning of it. You know, it's it's and then it's okay. It's one perspective and it's interesting to reflect on it. Um, but it should not stop at that's the thing, and that's why they stress that the mentoring and coaching should be before, during, and after um, the, practic the practice experiences because um, they experience things and then you have to work with these experiences. Otherwise, they will just copy behavior without reflecting. Um, they will just make their own and it's, it's not this inquiry anymore. It's not this multi perspectivity anymore. So, is there any well, Thank you very much. Is there any more questions? You can answer French, English, Spanish, Dutch, <laughs> uh, German, I guess. Okay. No, no, German, no. no. <laughs> okay, so don't ask her in German. Uh, <laughs> I don't speak German anyway. <laughs> Maybe you'll be tired now. <laughs> I guess. And a question from the... Okay. Well, if there is no more question, then I guess we, we can almost end here. Um, I'm going to switch into French for a few minutes. Uh, uh, pour ceux qui vont être là la prochaine fois, ce sera en français. Et...